Hello everybody, this is Dr. Nadeem and we are with Neelam Path Lectures, the Pursue series. As you are aware, all our lectures are available on YouTube. We also have a Telegram group, which you can join the group. It will help you in accessing all lecture related information. We have a Google Drive where all the PDF of the lectures are available and we have the master integration key by which you can navigate between the PDF as well as the YouTube lectures. These are the disclaimers and we are with phase 3 which is recorded pathology lectures. These are convenient for teachers, students as well as for the organizers. And today we have Pursue 7S which is Neuropathology Brain Infection Session 1 and we are streaming from IPGMER Kolkata and to talk on today's lecture we have Dr. Srishti Bhutta. She is an MBBS Honors Gold Medalist MD Pathology. She is a demonstrator in the Oncopathology Unit of the Department of Pathology IPGMER and SSK Hospital Kolkata with 12 publications in national and international journals with special interest in neuropathology, molecular genetics and hematopathology. I would request Dr. Shishti Bhutta ma'am, please start your lecture on brain infection. This is session one. Thank you so much. Over to you ma'am. So a very good morning. We are all set today to discuss brain infections and this is neuropathology module five and this is the part one of the lecture series. So let's start. What do we plan to talk today? We plan to discuss about brain infections, particularly the epidural and the subdural abscess, bacterial meningitis, the etiology, pathogenesis and complications of it, the CSF examination and microscopy, particularly of bacterial meningitis, gross and microscopic picture of bacterial meningitis, mycobacterial brain infections, neurosyphilis, fungal infections of the brain, particularly candida, aspergillus, mucor, histoplasma, and cryptococcus. And finally, the parasitic infections of the brain, particularly toxoplasmosis and neurocysticercosis. So bacterial infections. What is the protective mechanism of the brain? The brain is protected from these bacterial infections by the skull, the dura, as you can see. Let me just highlight it with the laser pointer for you. Yeah, so uh, yes, you have the dura, as you can see, right here, okay, the arachnoid matter, okay, and particularly the glial limitants, which is nothing but a meshwork of the astrocytic processes in the surface of the brain. Okay, so it is this dura, the arachnoid matter and the glial limitants, okay, which protects the brain together with the skull. Consequently, most bacterial infections spread to the brain by the bloodstream or the bacteria can penetrate into the brain if there is a break in the continuity of this protective layer. Such a discontinuity may be due to congenital defects, for example, encephalocele or meningomyelocele for that matter or maybe due to any trauma or a shunt. Now bacteria can also spread to the brain from infected air sinuses, the middle ear and the mastoid, okay? Because all of it is actually connected to the brain, particularly the air sinuses, the middle ear and the mastoid. They can also reach the brain either directly through the bone, especially in the areas where the bone plate, okay, is thin or through the veins, particularly the diploic veins and the dural venous sinuses or the intracerebral veins, as we all know. Now, what is epidural abscess? Okay, as you can see very well that this is an epidural abscess which has been shown diagrammatically. In this epidural space, which is nothing but a space which is filled with adipose tissue, and that exists normally around the spinal cord. A spinal epidural abscess arises when organisms from osteomyelitis or tuberculosis of the vertebral column spread to this space. There is no epidural space, you must note, in the cranium, as we had already previously discussed in the class of brain trauma, right? However, a cranial epidural abscess may develop when bacteria colonize a traumatic epidural hematoma 
or when infection from air sinuses extend into a plane that is between the dura and the bone okay so this is what is shown here and here itself okay see the dura which is pushed towards the inner side right so this is the epidural abscess in the brain and in the cns uh, involving the spinal cord now what about subdural abscess Subdural abscess, also called as subdural empyma, is an infection which may spread to the subdural space, either from the air sinuses or from the middle ear. The subdural space is traversed by bridging arteries and veins, but has no vascular network of its own. Therefore, antibiotics have no access to this space. Okay, treatment of the subdural space therefore consists of evacuation. plus intravenous antibiotics so evacuation with intravenous antibiotics in the subdural space vascularized inflamed connective tissue develops followed by a fibrous scar okay so then this undergoes fibrosis after healing Histologically, an acute subdural empyma shows a layer of neutrophils overlying the arachnoid matter. The inflammatory cells, okay, may infiltrate the arachnoid membrane and extend into the subarachnoid space as well. Okay, so as you can see very well that this is a subdural abscess and the dura is overlying this abscess right here. Okay, and this is the subdural space here which is filled with this infected material or abscess and microscopically this consists of neutrophils yes which overlies the arachnoid membrane the inflammatory cells can also infiltrate into the subarachnoid space now what is bacterial meningitis Bacterial meningitis is the infection of the arachnoid membrane subarachnoid space okay and the CSF by bacteria okay so as you can see in this diagram okay what do you see here you see the dura you see the arachnoid you see the sub subarachnoid space which is particularly very important because it is traversed by blood vessels okay and you see the pia and thereafter you see this brain parenchyma The subarachnoid space is bounded externally by the arachnoid membrane and internally by the pia. It dips into the brain along the blood vessels and forms what is called as the characteristic perivascular vercorobin space. Okay? It extends from the optic chiasma to the cauda equina and surrounds the brain and spinal cord completely. Right? Now how does this infection spread? The infection may spread to the meninges from an adjacent infected area such as a sinusitis or otitis media or mastoiditis or for that matter from any penetrating injury or congenital defect like a meningomyelocele. Most commonly however the meningitis results from a hematogenous dissemination of the bacteria. The most common organism that causes bacterial meningitis in children and adults is yes as we all know it is streptococcus pneumoniae and Neisseria meningitidis. In newborns however the most common infection is caused by beta hemolytic streptococcus group B that is streptococcus agalecti and E coli. Now coming to the pathogenesis the organism that causes bacterial meningitis usually colonize the nasopharynx okay and from there they get into the blood stream they enter the subarachnoid space by passing through the endothelial cells getting across the porous choroid plexus capillaries and are thereafter carried by the granulocytes okay the csf is an ideal medium for the spread of the bacteria because it provides enough nutrients for their multiplication and has fewer phagocytic cells as well as low levels of antibodies and complements so the bacterial products can damage the brain and blood vessels directly 
or the bacterial toxins can cause neuronal apoptosis and cell wall lipopolysaccharide and or endotoxin release from the bacteria can activate clotting factors resulting in characteristic DIC. Now, cells of the innate immune system of the brain, which are located in the blood-brain barrier, choroid plexus and ependyma, detect these bacteria and secrete cytokines, chemokines and complement which attract circulating granulocytes into the CSF. If neutrophils accumulate, they can damage the brain tissue, nerves and blood vessels, vasculitis and clotting causes cerebral infarcts as well, particularly due to DIC. So, brain damage in bacterial meningitis is caused in part by the direct action of the bacteria and in part by the antibacterial inflammatory response. So now, coming to the complications, the most dangerous complication of bacterial meningitis is an increase in the intracranial pressure, okay, particularly from cerebral edema, okay, that results in a severe headache. Now, this cerebral edema can either be vasogenic from increased vascular permeability, it can also be cytotoxic from cerebral hypoxia, or it can be interstitial from increased CSF volume or a combination of all. Increased intracranial pressure in turn causes a decreased cerebral perfusion and subsequent hypoxia and ischemia are precipitated which results in neuronal necrosis and that also precipitates a characteristic seizure and coma. Okay, so now we come to the CSF examination in bacterial meningitis. The cornerstone in the diagnosis of a bacterial meningitis is the CSF examination. Okay, history of preceding seizure and a peripheral blood absolute neutrophil count of more than 10,000 are the prerequisites. A CSF absolute neutrophil count of more than 100 cells per microliter and a high protein level of more than 80 milligrams per dl is particularly required with a low glucose level and a positive gram stain. Okay, so let's just see. Here we see a gram positive cocci, okay, that present singly and in clusters here in the CSF. So this is the gram stain of the CSF. A detailed discussion of the CSF examination would be held in the subsequent classes. Now coming to the gross picture. What do you see here? You see a characteristic pneumococcal meningitis and this is a purulent exudate of it on the surface of the brain. Okay, so this is the characteristic gross picture of a bacterial meningitis, particularly caused by pneumococcus in this case, and this is the purulent exudate. How about the microscopy? The microscopy shows a characteristic inflammatory exudate, which you see in the subarachnoid space, okay, with layering of neutrophils on the top, okay, and a deeper layer of fibrin at the bottom. It is important to note that there is also a vein with phlebitis and a clot that is present here. Okay. So this is the vein with phlebitis and a clot shown. Now neutrophils in the subarachnoid space infiltrate and damage the cranial nerves resulting in a cranial nerve deficit and invade the leptomeningeal vessels causing phlebitis and arterial and venous thrombosis with ischemic infarction. A thick fibrinopurulent exudate in the subarachnoid space characteristically organizes into the fibrous tissue that blocks the ventricles resulting in a hydrocephalus. So now coming to brain abscess. This fibrinopurulent exudate can invade into the brain parenchyma resulting in characteristic brain abscess. So what is this brain abscess? It is nothing but a newly formed cavity within the brain parenchyma that is filled with pus. The bacteria that cause brain abscess either spread from the air sinuses or from the middle ear or via the blood stream from the lungs or from the heart. The bacterial brain abscess may develop after neurosurgical procedures or even after open head injuries.
Now coming to the bacterial flora that is responsible for this brain abscess. In case of sinusitis and otitis, it is a polymicrobial infection, including the anaerobes. It may be a hematogenous abscess, which has disseminated, okay, and uh, is particularly caused by Staphylococcus or Streptococcus species. However, it must be noted, bacteremia alone cannot uh, cause brain abscess. Okay, some tissues damage, probably a small ischemic lesion is required to start the process of brain abscess bacteria in the blood, seep into the necrotic needles and spread around it, uh, causing a brain necrosis, particularly the liquefactive necrosis and acute inflammation or cerebritis. The necrotic center cavitates while at the periphery, a vascular zone of brain tissue with macrophages, mononuclear cells and reactive astrocytes contain the infection. In four to five weeks, the collagen is let down in this reactive process, forming a characteristic thick capsule that walls off this infection. OK, so now we come to mycobacterial infections. During a hematogenous dissemination of tuberculosis, small caseating lesions or tubercles develop in the meninges and in the brain tissue. Mycobacteria can survive in these lesions for a very long time. When tubercles rupture, mycobacteria are discharged into the CSF, causing characteristic tuberculous meningitis. The focus of the initial infection may be in the lungs and may be undetected. In some cases, the tuberculous meningitis has a fulminant presentation similar to that of bacterial meningitis. In other cases, it presents insidiously and progresses slowly over weeks and months, causing headache, confusion and cranial nerve deficits. The infection of the CSF causes acute inflammation initially. Two to three weeks later, however, there is a, a cell-mediated immunity which develops this enhances an intracellular killing of the mycobacteria by macrophages, okay, resulting in characteristic formation of epithelioid histiocytes. However, enzymes released by these dying macrophages cause necrosis of the infected tissue, particularly the necrotic tissue becomes cheesy and yellowish and is referred to as a caseous necrosis. Tuberculous infection of the brain sometimes results in the formation of a tumor-like mass, as we all know, which is called as a tuberculoma. This consists of a caseous necrotic material surrounded by epithelioid cell granulomas and mononuclear cells or lymphocytes. Rupture of this tuberculoma and release of mycobacteria into the subarachnoid space can result in a tuberculous meningitis. Okay. So now coming to the CSF examination in case of tuberculous meningitis. A detailed CSF examination, let me just tell you, will be highlighted in the subsequent classes. For now, just a brief discussion. The CSF in case of a tuberculous meningitis shows a characteristic pleocytosis with a predominance of mononuclear cells, a high protein level and a low glucose level. In addition, a ZN stain or a Zeal Nielsen stain may be done for highlighting the acid fast bacilli. So this is what it is. Let me just highlight it. So these are the acid fast bacilli which have been highlighted by the Zeal Nielsen stain in case of CSF. So now we move on to the gross examination of the brain in case of a mycobacterial or tuberculous meningitis. So what do you see here? You see the characteristic basal exudate in case of a tuberculous meningitis, a bilateral basal ganglia showing infarction and necrosis, and a tuberculoma of the frontal lobe highlighted in this figure C. Moving on to the microscopy, the histological features of a tuberculous meningitis are the same as that of a mycobacterial infection occurring anywhere else in the body. It particularly involves the epithelioid histiocytes, okay, the Langhans type giant cells as shown here in the microscopic picture given alongside and the lymphocytic infiltrate with a central caseous necrosis. Okay. The epithelioid cells are macrophages that are engaged in mycobacterial killing. They aggregate in clusters forming granulomas or fuse forming characteristic Langhans type giant cells. 
These changes involve the arachnoid membrane and the subarachnoid space diffusely. Also, unlike suppurative meningitis, in which the exudate is usually confined to the subarachnoid space, an epitheloid cell granuloma usually destroys the pia mater okay, and invades into the brain parenchyma. So now moving on to neurosyphilis. Neurosyphilis forms a spectrum of the manifestation caused by the spirochetal bacteria, that is, the treponema pallidum. During early syphilis, the spirochete has the ability to disseminate into the central nervous system and cause both symptomatic as well as asymptomatic meningitis and more severe vasculitis leading to thrombosis, ischemia and even death. During tertiary syphilis, the chronic inflammatory responses to the spirochete can severely compromise the brain parenchyma and spinal cord leading to Paris's and Tabus dorsalis. So, in tertiary syphilis, there is a neurological manifestation that shows characteristic meningovascular and parenchymal lesions. The meningovascular lesions are lymphoplasmocytic meningitis and an intimal thickening of the small and medium sized leptomeningeal and parenchymal arteries, resulting in a characteristic end arteritis. So in neurosyphilis, you see a characteristic crescentric collagenous thickening of the intima or the end arteritis and there is characteristic thinning of the in media. Okay. The lumen is reduced owing to the inflammatory infiltrate around the vessel which is rich particularly in plasma cells as you can make out. Okay. So there is a dense inflammatory infiltrate particularly rich in plasma cells and a characteristic thickening of the intima and a thinning of the media. The parenchymal lesions are the tables dorsalis. Okay, as you can make out here, there is a loss of myelinated axons in the posterior column. Okay, because this is the myelin stain which is shown here and this is showing a characteristic loss of myelinated axons in the posterior column right so tabus dorsalis is characterized by inflammation and degeneration of the dorsal roots and posterior column and resulting in a characteristic general generalized paresis or dementia paralytica and encephalitis due to invasion of the brain by the spirochetes so in addition syphilis also shows characteristic gammas in the brain so what is a gamma a gamma is nothing but a rubbery and necrotic lesion in the brain, okay, composed of inflammatory cells and histiocytes containing spirochetes. It forms a characteristic space occupying lesion in the brain. Syphilis can, in addition, also cause an acute meningitis during its secondary stage. Now coming to the CSF examination in neurosyphilis, a CSF VDRL is highly specific and is generally accepted as a diagnostic test in neurosyphilis. CSF RPR is not a recommended test due to its lower sensitivity. CSF treponemal tests also have a high sensitivity. CSF shows a characteristic pleocytosis which is defined as greater than 5 cells per microliter. Okay, particularly the WBC counts are more than 20 cells per microliter. This is sensitive but is not specific as both infectious and non-infectious diseases can cause a rise in the cell count. So now moving on to another condition which is the Lyme's disease. Okay, so it is caused by a tick bone spirochete that is the Borrelia burgdorferi. It is a second and third it sorry in its second and third stages it can cause meningitis radiculitis neuropathy and encephalitis leading to ataxia paralysis dementia and other neurological manifestations the csf shows a characteristic mononuclear pleocytosis and a mild protein elevation the pathology however is not well understood presumably there is a dense lymphoplasmocytic infiltrate and vasculitis that is noted in the brain and meninges as shown in the figure alongside okay so what do you see here you see a characteristic lymphoplasmocytic infiltrate okay around the vessels 
and a characteristic vasculite is noted in the brain and meninges. So now after the bacterial infections, we now move on to the fungal and parasitic infections of the nervous system. The most common cause of CNS mycosis in order of its frequency is candidiasis, aspergillosis and cryptococcosis. They are seen most commonly in patients who are immunosuppressed and have a acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Infection with the fungi cause a significant morbidity and mortality, particularly in immunocompromised individuals, and involvement of CNS may lead to fatal consequences. The pathogenesis behind the fungal infections in CNS is however not well understood. Penetration of the pathogen across the blood-brain barrier is an essential step for any CNS invasion. Blood-brain barrier disruption by trauma or surgery or activation of microglia and cytokines, particularly the TNF-alpha, results in characteristic disruption of the tight junctions of the blood-brain barrier. The infected phagocyte reaches the brain and adheres to the luminal side of the brain capillaries and crosses the blood-brain barrier. So as we had already discussed that uh, the main fungal infections of the brain are caused by cryptococcus, mucor and aspergillus as well as candida. So HIV infected individuals usually are susceptible to infections from cryptococcus neoformans whereas diabetic individuals usually suffer from infections by mucor. Hematological malignancies, particularly acute leukemia, uh, are predisposed to infections from aspergillus. Neutropenic and premature individuals are usually infected by aspergillus and candida respectively. Drug-induced immunosuppressions and medical interventions can also result in fungal infections. So now coming to candida. Candida, as we all know, is a common salt but rarely affects individuals. Candida can occur as budding yeasts and hyphae. It causes meningitis, multiple microabscesses and extensive brain necrosis. At first, the inflammation consists of neutrophils and later on, it consists of epithelial histiocytes and giant cells. In an immunocompromised state, candida species may overproliferate and lead to the development of invasive candidiasis. A disseminated candidiasis may result from the infection of the lung, respiratory system or digestive tract. So the figure shown alongside is the PAS stain or the PAS stain for that matter of candida showing the budding yeasts and the pseudo hyphae. Coming to aspergillus and mucor. Aspergillus and the related soil fungus that is mucor are branching hyphae. They are ubiquitous in nature and may cause diseases in immunosuppressed individuals. The most common risk factor for disseminated infections are neutropenia, cytotoxic chemotherapy and corticosteroids. Aspergillus enters the body through the lungs. Mucor, which is the most common in uh, patients typically who are diabetic, infects the nasal mucosa from where it spreads to the brain. Both fungi have a tendency to invade the blood vessels. Note, both the fungi have a tendency to invade the blood vessels and cause thrombosis with cerebral infarction and or vascular rupture and cerebral hemorrhage. Their angio-invasive property of aspergillus is due to the production of elastase by some species of aspergillus. Now coming to cerebral aspergillosis, which is a rare disease with a poor prognosis and has a high fatality rate. Aspergillus fumigatus is the most common organism followed by Aspergillus flavus, niger and terus. Aspergillus fumigatus most commonly infects the immunocompromised individuals, whereas Aspergillus flavus, niger and terus most commonly affect the immunocompetent hosts. Cavernous sinuses, meninges and frontal lobes are the most common sites. Aspergillosis with brainstem and cerebellar involvement are extremely fatal. 
Now the characteristic Aspergilla species comprise of the septate branching hyphae which branch at acute angles as you can see and make out here. So they are branching at acute angles. Okay, and the surrounding show, tissue shows a characteristic acute and chronic inflammatory infiltrate as shown in the figure alongside. There is also a characteristic granulomatous response with a foreign body type of giant cells as you can make out here. Now coming to rhinocerebral mucormycosis. This is an infection of the sinuses that can spread to the brain. This is most common in people with uncontrolled diabetes mellitus and also seen in patients with renal transplant. It rapidly progresses and is an angioinvasive disease. The angioinvasion results in characteristic thrombus formation and tissue necrosis. And this dead tissue nidus promotes additional growth of the mucor. As you can see alongside that this is a mucor. Okay, there are irregular branching hyphae which branch at 90 degrees. They are broad posi septate. Okay, so there is uh, no septation that you can make out. So posi septate or aseptate hyphae branching at 90 degrees. Okay, they show a characteristic involvement of the vessel and their angioinvasive property has been highlighted by the Grocot Gomery methanamine silver stain or the GMS stain. So now coming to cryptococcus. Cryptococcus is an oval yeast which is about the size of a red blood cell and is surrounded by a gelatinous capsule. The capsule of the fungus comprises of the glucoronoxylomannan and the glucoronoxylomannocalactin which are the major polysaccharides and the major contributors to the virulence of the pathogen. The most common that is the cryptococcus neoformans is the one which causes about 95% of the infections. It is a worldwide fungus which is present in the bird droppings, vegetables and soil. It mainly affects the healthy individuals but is particularly common in uh, immunodeficient. Sorry, it may affect healthy individuals but is particularly common in immunodeficient individuals, particularly having AIDS or HIV. The portal of entry is the respiratory tract but pulmonary infections may be asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic. Cryptococcal meningitis uh, usually happens due to the spread of the infection to the brain from the lungs without involving any other organs. So in the CNS, cryptococcus grows extensively, particularly in the subarachnoid space and the perivascular spaces, which become cystically dilated to the point that the brain sections look like a Swiss cheese. Okay. So these cryptococci are variably sized, that is about 3.5 to 8 micron in size. They are round to oval yeast forms, okay? And they are often encapsulated, as you can make out by this clear space. They have a thin cell wall. They show a characteristic narrow-based budding. And chronic lesions with unencapsulated un un forms may mimic a blastomyces. Cryptococcal meningitis is the leading cause of fungal meningitis worldwide. In immunosuppressed individuals, inflammation is absent or mild. In immunocompetent hosts, on the other hand, the cryptococcus elicits a cell-mediated immune response with lymphocytes and epithelioid histiocytes and giant cells, as you can make out. Rarely cryptococcus can cause mass lesions or cryptococcoma. Cryptococcus meningitis has an insidious onset. It may go on for weeks to years. It can cause hydrocephalus, dementia, cranial neuropathies and focal neurological deficits. The CSF in cryptococcosis shows a mononuclear pleocytosis, elevated protein and a low glucose that is similar to that seen in tuberculous meningitis. Yeasts can be identified by microscopy of the CSF and their antigens can be detected by latex agglutination. So the most commonly used method for detecting the capsule of the cryptococcus is the India ink preparation, right? So the capsule is a non-ionic uh, structure, okay? And therefore the India ink will not bind to it. 
This is the reason why the capsule appears to be as a clear halo around the yeast cells. What is done is that the CSF is centrifuged for 5 to 10 minutes, the supernatant is uh, removed and the sediment is mixed and transferred with an equal amount of India ink. That is a drop of sediment is added to the slide and a drop of India ink is added to the slide. It is mixed and covered with a cover slip. Now examined under the microscope okay, using the 40x objective. So what do we see? Yes, it is uh, clearly shown here that the clear halo around the cell depicts a cryptococcal capsule which has been highlighted here with the India ink preparation, right? Now coming to histoplasmosis. Histoplasmosis is a disease caused by histoplasma capsulatum. The manifestation of the disease in the central nervous system is most frequently seen in immunosuppressed individuals with disseminated presentation. Pulmonary manifestations are usually the first symptoms. However, when neurological manifestations are the first clinical manifestations, the diagnosis becomes a challenge. The early diagnosis is fundamental in the final outcome of the patient. So, these histoplasma are nothing but the small uniform oval narrow based budding yeasts okay as shown in the figure here okay they have a characteristic eccentric acorn like nuclei which is clustered within a histiocyte that is it is an intracellular organism it must also be noted that there may be an illustrated granulomatous immune response in the surrounding brain parenchyma now coming to toxoplasmosis, the protozoan Toxoplasma gondii infects approximately one third of the world's population. The organism reproduces sexually in the intestinal tract of the cats and forms oocysts which are excreted in a cat's feces. The protozoan released from the oocysts ingested by animals and humans invades the brain, eye, heart, skeletal muscle and other organs where they form tissue cysts. Humans and animals are infected from the oocysts in the cat feces and from poorly cooked meat containing tissue cysts. Parasites released from oocysts and tissue cysts reside in cell vacuoles and are protected from host defenses. Most primary infections are asymptomatic or cause a self-limited granulomatous lymphadenitis. Latent infections are also silent. Now, if the primary infection occurs during pregnancy, toxoplasma may cross the placenta and cause a devastating necrotizing encephalitis and chorioretinitis in the fetus. The end result of a congenital toxoplasmosis is a severe brain damage, a microcephaly, cerebral calcifications and blindness. Reactivation of the latent toxoplasmosis in immunosuppressed individuals such as patients with HIV or AIDS causes toxoplasma encephalitis characterized by necrosis and mononuclear cell infiltrates. The lesions contain a single organism and cyst which can be identified histologically or by immunohistochemistry. About 25% patients dying from AIDS have toxoplasma encephalitis. So this is what you see. You see encysted bradyzoids in the brain parenchyma with surrounding inflammatory reaction in case of a toxoplasmosis. Now coming to neurocysticercosis. Cysticercosis is the most common parasitic infection and neurocysticercosis is the most common cause of secondary seizures worldwide. Cysticercosis is caused by ingestion of water, vegetables and other food fecally contaminated by eggs excreted by carriers of pork tapeworm tinea solium. So in the intestine, the eggs transform into oncospheres which penetrate the intestinal wall enter the circulation and lodge in the brain, eyes, muscles and other tissues. Their oncospheres develop into cystid sarcae. The same consequence occurs in pigs, which are the intermediate hosts of the tinea solium, as we all know. 
in pigs the cystic cirrhosis affects the muscles primarily after consumption of pork containing cystic cirrhosis scoliosis attach to the small intestinal wall and develop into the adult worms this condition is called as intestinal tenacity eggs or proglottids of the adult worms are then shed in the feces contaminating the environment the lesions of the cystic cirrhosis are thin walled cysts filled with clear fluid containing tiny parasites or scoliosis they may be present in brain tissues meninges and cerebral ventricles in the brain and other tissues cystic cirrhosis are initially protected from the immune system and may remain undetected until they degenerate at this time a mixed inflammatory reaction develops leading to the formation of a calcified nodule so let so coming to the microscopy of neurocystic cirrhosis which shows a characteristic larval form the larval form is composed of duct like invagination okay lined by a double layered eosinophilic membrane the scolex which is single and invaginated and contains rostellum four suckers and 22 to 23 birefringent hooklets and the body wall exhibits a myxoid matrix and calcareous bodies or calcified concretions there are basically three stages of involution one is the colloidal stage the other is the granular stage and finally a granulomatous reaction that develops in the colloidal stage which is the first stage of involution the transparent vesicular fluid is replaced by a turbid viscous fluid and the scolex shows signs of hyaline degeneration in the granular stage the cystic cirrhosis are no longer viable and the cyst wall thickens and the scolex is transformed into a coarse mineralized granular substance host inflammatory reaction is usually not present if the larva is viable Finally there is a granulomatous reaction that develops characterized by histiocytes epithelioid cells foreign body type giant cells leading to fibrosis of the supporting stroma and calcification of the parasitic debris as you can see alongside here okay so these are the calcified spherules that you can make out the calcified concretions or the lamellar uh, calcifications that you can make out in case of a neurocystic cirrhosis so finally concluding infections of the central nervous system are caused by a wide variety of organisms including the bacteria fungi parasites and viruses so viruses will be discussed in the subsequent class in the clinical course if we consider there may be an acute subacute or chronic manifestation depending on the pathogen location and immune status of the host CNS infections are associated with high morbidity and mortality. Rapid diagnosis and emergent interventions are necessary to improve the outcome of these patients. The laboratory diagnosis of the CNS infection is essential for optimal therapy. A timely CSF examination can give a wealth of information as well as uh, from the csf we can also do gram stain and even fungal stains like the grocot gomery methanamine silver stain or even culture bacteria fungi and mycobacteria for that matter histopathology almost always gives a clue to the underlying infectious uh, agent with the help of special stains particularly pas or gms so thank you so much for your patient hearing and before i sign off i'd like to thank nadeem sir uh, sir it's been a pleasure doing this neuropathology lecture series and i hope i continue to do the same meet you all next time with brain infections caused by viruses thank you so much